So the last time we were talking, I mean, we had that lab activity uh, to finish the hour yesterday. But before we were doing that, we were talking about geometric isomers, and we ended with this set of examples. I do want you to know, that I'm not going to ask you to know anything about stereoisomers. I just want you to be aware that there is a third type of isomer. We're not going to do anything with it. It's a little bit complicated, uh, but it happens when you have a carbon in a molecule that has four different types of atom attached to it. That gives rise to a different type of isomer. It, it has to do with spatial arrangement, too, how the uh, atoms are arranged around the carbon. Um, but uh, I just mentioned this because if you take another organic class, and many of you will, you'll have to take either an organic class here at Detroit High or, or off in college. You'll have three types of isomers. You'll have structural, you'll have geometric, and there'll be stereo isomers you'll have to keep track of. Uh, so just know that there's that. It's difficult. I'm going to skip it in here. It, it doesn't really help us uh, with our, our small amount of organic chemistry that we're going to learn uh, to know that, that fine detail. Okay, so you guys are at an advantage, and the sophomores watching this are at an advantage uh, if you if we do this before the reading quiz, because the, the lot that's on the reading quiz I will cover on this. I would say, though, to study for the reading quiz, I think that you should still review the textbook and not just depend on the notes that I give for this, but I am going to give you some of the details about these different types of reactions. Now, so the way you take your reading quiz tomorrow should be really easy. All right, so there's just a few types of reactions that we're going to talk about in here. A substitution reaction is the first one. Um, substitution reaction, you have to start with a saturated compound. A halogen is going to wind up being added onto it. The book doesn't really give what the mechanism or what the pathway for this reaction is. I want to share that with you today. Uh, so you start with a saturated molecule, this is butane, which is naturally a gas. If you put chlorine into it, which is also a gas, those two reactants will just kind of occupy the space together. Nothing is going to happen unless you do something to it. That thing you need to do to it is you have to shine ultraviolet light. Uh, that's what I have there. That, that little UV means um, ultraviolet light is a high energy light, it will actually break the two CLs apart from each other. I didn't calibrate this thing either, and we're going to see what we get. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be off by much. Let's see if I can get this done. So the chlorine molecule is going to break up into two chlorine atoms. Okay, yeah, my, my writing it looks like I'm intoxicated or something as I write on this crazy board. But uh, that's, that's a pair of electrons. Each of these chlorines has a single unpaired electron after they break apart from each other. It makes them very reactive. Um, they're, they're so reactive, they'll find anything to bond that unpaired electron to. So if, you, if, if the chlorine is around another chlorine atom, they'll immediately bond and join back together again. But if it encounters one of these butane atoms, what one of the chlorines is going to do is just going to rip a hydrogen right off of the carbon. One of the carbons, just take a hydrogen right off. And look at what one of the products is. One of the products will be HCl, where the, this very reactive chlorine just pulls a hydrogen off. The other chlorine finds its way over here, and on the carbon, the carbon had its hydrogen. Carbon's like, hold on, I was bonded to that thing. And the chlorine just ripped it right away from it. So the other chlorine goes on there, and it will bond to the carbon that lost its hydrogen. And so that's why we get a carbon now with a chlorine on it. The other chlorine is now tied up with an HCl molecule. Both chlorines now have found that stability of bonding that unpaired electron. Um, and uh, that's how we get from a simple uh, alkane to a halogenated Okay, that just means that uh, it's, it's taken on a halogen. Yeah. I'll use that term halogen all the time this year. You'll hear me say halogen a lot. You remember the halogens? I'm looking over the periodic table, but it's pulled up. The fluorine family. 
Group 17 of the periodic table, fluorine, bromine, chlorine, uh, iodine, all of those are uh, very common. Fluorine, not so much, but Cl, Br, and I are, are real common. You'll see those in a lot of reactions. So yeah, I've got these bullet points of what happens. Uh, the ultraviolet breaks the chlorine into two Cl atoms. Uh, one of the chlorines, very reactive atoms, grabs the hydrogen and pulls it off of the carbon. Other chlorine, they kind of are acting like Drake and Josh. You know, once they break apart, uh, they, they can't sit still. Just like Drake and Josh, they, they never are sitting around and doing, they're, they're getting into something. Um, well, that's what's going on here, um, is uh, they, one grabs items and the other one goes in and replaces it. They kind of do this team effort. And I, I want to explain this last part down here. Which carbon is going to actually get the hydrogen? I mean, not the hydrogen, the halogen. Of the four carbons, is there one of them that's more preferred to take the halogen over others? It actually turns out that there is. A tertiary carbon is the most likely to take a, a halogen. Now, what do I mean by tertiary? You might not know what that means. A tertiary carbon is a carbon that's attached to three other carbons. So when you have a C, with a C there, a C there, and a C there, and then it's got a hydrogen on it. That is a tertiary carbon. So, ah, you know what? Let me just redo that. Tertiary means this carbon right there, that carbon. Um, it's got three other carbons on it, so it's very much kind of in the middle of the um, molecule. Where a second, and by the way, this compound does not have any tertiary carbon. These carbons in the middle, they have two carbons attached to it, but not three. So there's no tertiary carbons. So the next best is a secondary carbon. Secondary carbons when you have a carbon that's got two carbons attached to it and then just a hydrogen. So yeah, any of these CH2s in the middle would be two, uh, secondary carbons. And then primary carbons are the carbons on the end. Primary means it's just attached to one other carbon. It's got hydrogens all over it. Uh, they're on the end. So when we have a substitution reaction, the halogen is more likely to go somewhere in the middle of the molecule than on the end. It's not likely to go there. Now, can some of the CLs attach to the end? Yeah, I mean, you'll get a mixture of products. Some of the CLs will be on the end carbon, some of them will be on carbon number two. And then when they go on this carbon, that's also carbon number two, because uh, you know it would be closer to that end. Any questions on substitution reaction? All right, so yeah, um, one of the hydrogens gets replaced, also known as substituted by a The next type of reaction is the addition reaction. Addition reactions, you have to start with an unsaturated compound. You have to. So um, uh, the general pattern for an addition reaction looks like this. You've got an alkene and then a small molecule. Uh, the small molecules will break apart like you did in the last case. Uh, and then what's going to happen is the small molecule is going to add on to the original organic reactant. And here's how it works. I'm going to use a term that you probably are not going to be familiar with. When we have this double bond between the two carbons and the alkane, the double bond is where uh, four electrons are being shared. Each, each line represents two electrons, okay? So when you have a single bond, we've got two electrons being shared. When a double bond is there, that means that there's four electrons being shared. Now, four electrons can't fit very well in between two carbon atoms. They'd repel each other. So what happens is two of them, so both of these lines are drawn exactly the same. It looks like they're both the same kind of bond. They're not, they're, they're two different types of bond. Oh gosh, I have to account for the bad calibration at the top of this thing. So if I, that big blue area, that's where the first pair of electrons is being shared. That's the first bond between the two. That's known as a sigma. Bond. 
So that's a sigma bond. The second bond, I'll use a different color for it. The second bond is not in that space because there's too, too little room for all this negative charge. So the second bond, ah, I'm still trying to, ah, oh man. Okay, so there's my sigma bond. Okay, then the, the second bond is going to be down there, and I'll exaggerate that, up there. The red little curvature that I made above and below, that's the second pair of electrons that are being shared. That's what a double bond looks like. You've got one bond where the electrons are shared directly in between the two carbons. The other bond is, is a, a sharing of two electrons above and below the sigma bond. This red bond is called, it, it's got a different name, it's called a pi bond. Both of these are Greek letters, sigma and pi. You know pi. Okay, so you got a pi bond there, and then, ah, I, So a pi bond has two parts to it. This is not two separate pi bonds. This represents two electrons being shared. One pi bond. This is exaggerated too. I mean, the pi bond really would be right above and right below the sigma bond. Um, but because I'm having trouble coordinating my, my writing with uh, the calibration on the board, I, I did make it exaggerated. I show you that because I want you to see when these two chlorines come apart and they become very, very reactive, they're going to want to react with the first thing that they can get to. The most vulnerable part of this molecule is the pi bond. That's the most vulnerable part of the molecule. So the chlorines attach to the pi bond. Remember, the pi bond is two electrons being shared. So when that bond between the two carbons is broken, each carbon now has an unpaired electron. And both chlorines then can attach themselves to those two unpaired electrons. So you get both chlorines out. This is an addition reaction. Why do we call it addition? Because the molecule started with six atoms, two carbons, four hydrogens, and it ended with eight atoms, two carbons, the four hydrogens, plus two CLs. So we added on, we made a bigger molecule. It's a halogenation reaction. An addition reaction does not necessarily have to be a halogenation. You can have other things add on to it. You'll see it, the example down below uh, is not a halogenation, but it's still an addition reaction. Okay. So addition, you have to start with an unsaturated compound. It's got that pi bond. The pi bond, the electrons are vulnerable, and that's what makes it happen. Make sense? Is that all right? Now, um, another example would be the same unsaturated compound reacting with water. We come up with a means for splitting the hydrogen and uh, the oxygen apart in water. Now, normally when you split water apart, the oxygen hangs on to one of the H's and it's just one of the two H's that comes off. So you'll have this thing split into an H and an OH. That's almost always the way that, hydrogen, that water sorry, will split apart. I'm just get rid of one of its hydrogen. The two uh, H and OH do the same thing as the two chlorines did. They'll attack that vulnerable pi bond. The hydrogen goes on one of the carbons, the OH goes on the other carbon. In a couple minutes, I'm going to talk about this compound. This compound now has a different functional group that we haven't dealt with before, an OH. We've seen hydrocarbon functional groups, we've seen halogen function groups like a chlorine or a bromine or whatever. We haven't seen oxygen as a function group. That's where we're going to go um, after this reaction. So what are the products of this reaction, this addition reaction? What do you get? I'll give you a second. See if you can come up with what the products of this reaction are. You should recognize it'll be an addition reaction.
Dev Julia? Okay, CH3, CH2, CH2 with a BR up here. Is that what you had, Julie? Awesome, great, thank you. Well, we have an addition reaction. It went from unsaturated to saturated. There's another possible product. Anybody have something else? Do you? It's possible, yeah, because, I mean, the H and the BR, you got an H atom and a BR atom, they're gonna either go on, whoops, that carbon or that carbon. So, uh, the hydrogen could certainly go on that carbon, the BR could go on that carbon, just like what you have. So, yeah, your other possible product would be CH3, CH, BR on it, CH3. Yeah, so these are the two possible products for this reaction. Is there one that would be more correct? or that's preferred over the other one. It turns out that there is. Just like what I was talking about with the substitution. This one um, actually was investigated and it has a rule, a name of a rule attached to it. It's called Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule is actually described in one of the homework exercises in the book. When you get there, you'll be like, oh yeah, yeah I remember him talking about Markovnikov's rule. What a name too. This guy's name was Vladimir Vasilovich Markovnikov. Wow, imagine him trying to fill out the SAT bubbling, you know, they're like, okay, we're waiting for uh, Vladimir here, he's got so many bubbles to do. Um, but which one of these two products is more likely to be made? Markovnikov did this reaction, not necessarily with HBr, but, but he did reactions with hydrogen and, and uh, other atoms over and over and over. And he found that there was a pattern. He found that um, on the original alkene, the carbon that started with the most hydrogens has more has the hydrogen added to it in the reaction. So the carbon that started with the more hydrogens gains another hydrogen if it could. So uh, you know the uh, the. The funny way of saying that is the carbon that's the richest in, in hydrogens gets even richer. And what makes it funny is that Markovnikov lived in um, you know, a, a communist country where only the government people and the government's friends are rich and everybody else is oppressed and they're poor. So um, you know, uh, for, for a Russian to, to observe, oh, the rich are getting richer, it, it just is um, politically a little bit funny. So which of these two products is more likely? Uh, the more likely one would be this one, where the carbon on the end started with two hydrogens, the carbon in the middle started with just one hydrogen, so the rich carbon got richer. It went from two hydrogens to three. Now that is consistent with what I said about substitution. A halogen is more likely to attach to a secondary carbon than it is to a primary carbon. And in this case, the bromine would be attaching to the primary carbon, which is not what like. Now, I will tell you that there, it's not like it's 100% all of these that are made. Uh, you, you'll get some of this product made, but the major product, we say the major product will be that one. And that's what it says down here. There's more coffee. So many of those guys from the 1800s Man, they grew that beard out real long. I don't know if it was uh, all guys that did that or, or the mathematicians and the scientists thought, oh, well, we need to distinguish ourselves. We're going to grow a long beard. Um, I, I don't know what culturally uh, that, that represented. Okay, so yeah, we've got, um, we've got a couple of types of reactions going on here. And then back to what I was saying about compounds that have OH on them. We're going to go there next. Compounds that have OH. The OH functional group is called the hydroxyl group. And it looks like a hydroxide ion, but the OH is not an ion. Uh, it is neutral. And it would just share electrons with a carbon. So 
when you have an alcohol, and, and that's what you have, uh, when you have an OH on there, it's an alcohol. Alcohols will have a little bit different name. Uh, you'll, you'll add on OL. Actually, you just drop the E off to the parent and use OL at the end. Um, and we do need to specify where the OH is. So when you have something like this, CH4 is methane. So when the OH replaces the hydrogen, we call that methanol. We don't have to specify where there's only one carbon on there. But something like this, where there's five carbons, and one of the things on it is OH, we do have to say which of the five carbons has the OH on it. So that's carbon number two. We call that two pentanol. So alcohols are alcohols are very common. Of course, we've all heard of alcohols, um, but yeah, the, the term alcohol is not just specific to one liquid. Um, which the most common alcohol, the one that, that people drink, is ethanol. Ethanol is also used as a fuel in cars. Um, ethanol's got a lot of great uses. It's a very uh, abundantly made chemical here. Or, or, you know, whether it's synthetic or, or uh, grown, developed or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of ethanol that's made. And that's just two carbons with OH on them. Okay, so other types of organic compounds. If you have a carbon in the chain and it's got a double bonded oxygen, if it's a secondary carbon, we call that compound now, it changes the identity of the whole compound, we call it a ketone, a ketone. Ketones are fragrant molecules. The most common ketone that we, uh, we have all over the place, well, here's an example of a ketone, uh, a six carbon chain with the double bonded oxygen on carbon number three, we would call that six hexanone. So we keep the name hexane, we just drop the E and use O-N-E at the end. The most well-known ketone though, you'll recognize this one, maybe not by its chemical formula, but by its name. This ketone, just three carbons, is the smallest ketone possible. Um, this is in its proper name, known as propanone, there's three carbons, propanone, but um, most people know it as acetone, acetone. So if you've ever smelled nail polish remover, it's got a very um, unique, strong smell to it. I love the smell of acetone, I think it's great. Some people don't like it, um, but yeah, in general, ketones do have unique fragrances. There's a lot of ketones that are perfumes. Another type of compound that has a C double bonded O in it, a carbonyl, is when the carbonyl group is on the very end carbon, on the primary carbon. Uh, that would make it not a ketone anymore, it would make it an aldehyde. So aldehyde is another class of organic compound. So we've seen alcohols, which have an OH somewhere on the molecule. We've seen ketones, which have a double bonded oxygen. It's gotta be in the middle, it cannot be on the end carbon. And then there's aldehydes where the carbonyl group, the C double bond O, is on the end carbon. So um, aldehydes are also fragrant and uh, they'll have that, that double bond O on the end. We name them with an AL at the end. So alcohols need to end with OL, aldehydes would end with AL. So yeah, four carbons, the end carbon has a carbonyl on it, uh, we would call that butanal. If it was five carbons, we call it pentanet. Any questions on that? It's not bad. There's actually quite a bit of information. Julian? For which one? For an aldehyde? There are no numbers for an aldehyde. Notice I didn't call this one butanol because by definition, uh, the carbonyl group has to be on the end. So if you see it ends with AL, 
you know it's an aldehyde, and you know that the C double bond O is carbon number one. Okay, so we don't have to say what butanol, that would be redundant. We do have to specify which carbon in the ketones because you know it could be there, that would be two hexanone, that would be three hexanone. Uh, but yeah, uh, with, with aldehydes, you're always going to have the C double bond O as carbon number one. Is that what you were asking, Julia? Propanone on, uh, for this one? Yeah. 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 Actually, you don't even have to. The two would be redundant because the only, if it ends in O N E, you know the carbon delta group has to be on a secondary carbon. There's only one secondary carbon in this molecule. So you could just call it propanone. If you call it two propanone, I won't mark it wrong, but you don't need the two in that case. Now, if there were four carbons, we still wouldn't need the two because if you put a cover number two or three, it's still going to be two propanone or two, two butanone. Yeah, it's only when you get up to five carbons in a row that you have to specify which, what number, five and more. Yeah. Jacob? So theoretically, it wouldn't matter what double bond of oxygen would be used up. Like it wouldn't matter which one. Which, yeah, could be this one just as much as that one. Oh, yeah. Because I got to just take this thing and turn it around. It's the same thing. You don't do anything with the molecule. Yep. Okay. So aldehydes, ketones, and alcohols. This is the last topic for the day. I just have a couple of slides about this. Organic oxidation reactions um, are defined like this. Uh, in organic chemistry, oxidation means either the gain of oxygen, which would make sense why we call it oxidation, but it could also be the loss of hydrogen. So oxidation can occur in both of those forms, either the gain of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen. Now I will tell you that in a few weeks, several weeks from now, we're gonna start doing chapter four. Chapter four has this, and by the way, after this chapter 22 test, we'll be done with organic chemistry, and, and I'll refer to this sometimes, but I won't be teaching you any more organic chemistry. We'll be doing the inorganic chemistry like you're so familiar with from last year. We'll talk about oxidation reactions in inorganic chemistry in a few weeks, and uh, it will feel way different from what you see here. Organic chemistry has a very specific definition of, of what oxidation is. It doesn't look like what it does in inorganic chemistry. Um, but I will tell you, at the very core of it, oxidation really has the same meaning. It just looks different in the two different branches of chemistry. So, Here's why we care about oxidation. We care about oxidation because an aldehyde is made when an, uh, a primary alcohol oxidizes. So this is how we can make aldehydes. You take a primary alcohol, um, and remember, primary means that you're talking about the end carbon. So you got the OH on the last carbon. That's a primary alcohol. A secondary alcohol would be where the OH is on one of the middle carbons. Um, and then a tertiary, we'll, we'll see what tertiary looks like later. But here's what, uh, what's going on. This is called 1-propanol. One 1-propanol. One O-L at the end, not L, O. If I put 1-propanol into a container, like some beaker or a flask or whatever, if it just sits there uh, and I don't do anything to it, it, it won't change. It doesn't just decide, oh, well, I think I'm going to oxidize. We need to add something to it called an oxidizing agent to actually initiate this kind of reaction. So I'm going to just put that up here. You, you don't know need to know any specific oxidizing agent is what it's called. An oxidizing agent is a chemical that you add to it that will cause this thing to oxidize. Just a couple of examples. I mentioned these to maybe spring forth some of your memory about last year. So examples of oxidizing agents might be KMNO4. Now we didn't talk about oxidation, but you might recognize this compound. KMNO4 is potassium permanganate. It's a very common oxidizing agent. I'm not gonna test you on this. Don't worry about memorizing different oxidizing agents. I'm just showing you this. Um, and then another, oops, K2, CR2O7, it's hard to read. 
but either potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate, if you remember your polyatomic ions, those are common oxidizing agents. So I will actually have a demonstration for you tomorrow where I'll, I'll show you the oxidation of um, a couple of different alcohols. I'll show you a primary alcohol and then a, a secondary alcohol and see what it looks like. So once this primary alcohol oxidizes, what happens is one of the hydrogens comes off of the carbon, and then the hydrogen comes off of the oxygen, so that both the carbon and the uh, oxygen lose a hydrogen. Therefore, they can both make one more bond. They will make a second bond between them. There's already one bond between the carbon and the oxygen. They'll make a second bond by getting rid of a hydrogen each. So you'll notice that the C loses an H, the oxygen loses an H. There's my hydrogen. It comes out, it bubbles up. And then the carbon makes a second bond with the oxygen. And still it's attached to one hydrogen. See that carbon originally had two H's on it. Uh, it goes just down to one H. There it is. And it makes a second bond with the oxygen. That makes an aldehyde. Now the carbon's made a double bond with that uh, oxygen. It's on the end of the molecule. That's now an aldehyde. Yeah? Is the two hydrogens? I take these two hydrogens? Say hello to Julia. Why would you take the hydrogens from the CH2 and the OH, not the CH3 and the CH2? Oh, um, the, yeah, when this thing oxidizes, the carbon is already attached to the oxygen. So in order for it to make a second bond with the oxygen, when we add one of these oxidizing agents, the oxidizing agent is going to react with the side that's got the oxygen on it. It does not even touch this side. This side of the molecule is not terribly interesting to most um, reacting this is a much more reactive side where the oxygen. Oxygen's a way more reactive element than carbon is. I guess that's what it comes down to. So when you have an oxygen part of the molecule, it's what gets attacked. The oxygen part gets attacked. Really what's happening is the oxygen is a very high electronegativity element. The oxygen is, that bond right there is being hogged by the oxygen because it's got so much more of a pull on shared electrons. So that carbon is kind of starving for electrons because the oxygen is such a hog, it's pulling the electrons away. So that really leaves that carbon kind of vulnerable uh, for the oxidizing agent to come in. It really is that carbon that's getting attacked, but it's because of the oxygen. So oxygen being the more reactive thing, that end of the molecule is where it gets all the action. These don't get touched, okay? And you'll see that very consistently through all these reactions. It's only where the oxygens are that gets messed with. The, the non-polar parts of the molecule are just using it, nothing. Somebody out there? Is that Mr. Morrison? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, see, I, I see Julie keep looking out there. Oh, he's talking to somebody else's side. Okay. So are you good with that? Yeah, we got the hydrogen coming off that carbon and off of that oxygen, and we get the aldehyde. An aldehyde can then be oxidized again. It, it can oxidize. Uh, so if we still have enough of the oxidizing agent, the aldehyde that's made, um, if there's any water there especially, uh, what happens is the water is going to, this is a little bit involved, this hydrogen, and one of these hydrogens also comes off. This, this water loses hydrogen, that aldehyde loses its hydrogen at the end. We get another hydrogen molecule. And then the OH that's left from the water comes over here and adds on to the carbon. So that makes this functional group at the end of the molecule now. Anytime you have a molecule that has a C with a double bond to an O and an OH, at the end, is an acid. It's an acid, an organic acid. Specifically, we call it a carboxylic acid. This, this functional group is called a carboxyl group. 
But the presence of the carboxyl group changes the type of compound. We no longer think of it as an aldehyde. It's now got its own identity, it's an acid. And so it gets named with the nomenclature for acids. So ketones end in O-N-E, alcohols end in O-L, aldehydes end in A-L. Acids names will end with oic acid. So we have three carbons here, that's pro, it originally it was propane. But now that we have the carboxylic acid on the end there, it's propanoic acid. You don't need to give a number to acids, the cetal mono OH only goes on the end of the molecule. So we've seen an introduction of some types of compounds, but then how those compounds can be made uh, is what we're seeing here. And I'm just going to have one more slide uh, that I'll go over, and we'll call it a day. That one more slide is the formation of a ketone. I'm talking about how a ketone is a carbonyl group, a C double bond O in the middle somewhere. How do we get a ketone? Same way, kind of, uh, we'll have an oxidation reaction in which we start with a secondary alcohol. Secondary alcohol, remember, the OH is attached to one of the middle carbons. So if we expose this secondary alcohol to an oxidizing agent, again, I don't need you to know what different oxidizing agents are out there, what one you should use. Just know that it's got to have some, some reactant added to it that causes it to oxidize. The O loses an H, the carbon loses an H, there's my H2. And so those two will be able to make another bond between them. We get the C double bond. So aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids are all made from oxidation reactions. Once a ketone is made, it won't oxidize anymore. You can put as much oxidizing agent into a ketone as you want, and you're not going to see anything in it. It's nothing. It's done. And then if you have a tertiary alcohol, I'll just give you the simplest uh, tertiary alcohol. If you have an alcohol like that, where there's a tertiary carbon, um, since that carbon doesn't have any hydrogens that can be pulled off and have to lose it, uh, they just don't oxidize. They won't do anything. You put an oxidizing agent in there and it just sits there. So, just to be clear, this is a tertiary alcohol. Can I answer anything about this? That's a lot. <laughs> we're, we were busy today. Uh, now it's early, you know, we have 10 minutes or so left in the uh, class period, but then we're taking up the time for the reading quiz. So we'll do the reading quiz tomorrow. Don't forget about that. It's not going to get a schedule then tonight. But then that's good. All right. So we're done for the day.